All right, let's get started. Uh, TGIF, I know that this has been a bit of an interesting week. We've got a, another big round of snow uh, on Wednesday. And so I appreciate all of your hard work and uh, folks that are able to come here today. Thank you for doing that. I also appreciate folks who are able to join on Zoom. Um, I know that this is also like midterm week and time for a lot of people and that you're super busy. So I'm gonna to try to keep uh, today's class a little bit more low key, uh, not a ton of new content, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get out a little bit early for today. So um, we're just gonna to use today's class as a way to pick up on and continue to explore some of the ideas surrounding rhetorical listening uh, and the ways that we can think about again things like culture and gender as part of the process of listening and uh, the work that we do. Before we do that, I just wanted to give a quick mention with regard to spring and spring scheduling. Uh, so you all should probably know or receive an email by now that uh, spring courses are now available uh, for you to take. So for most folks, you should now be able to register for spring courses. I encourage you to register as soon as possible if you have not already started to register uh, because, you know, courses fill up. Uh, and it's a great way to make sure that you're getting the courses that you need in order to be on track for graduation. I definitely recommend reaching out to your advisor if you haven't already done so to help with slotting and scheduling uh, for your classes in the spring. So uh, as far as new classes and things go, um, this spring, I'm going to be teaching three courses. I'm teaching uh, two sections of communication theory, one offered face-to-face, -face, one online. That's kind of a nice survey and crash course. It gets into a lot of different areas in communication. Uh, but the other course I wanted to direct you to that I've mentioned a little bit in class and also posted the flyer for in a recent Canvas announcement is new course we're offering here at EOU this spring uh, in communicating health and science, right? So this is uh, an area of expertise, it's what I do. Um, I've published in journals including health communication and science communication. I do a lot of work on the relationship between health and disability. So this course is being offered in the spring. Uh, and you're welcome to register for it if you would like to, if you're interested in the content, if you're a comm major or if you're not a major. Um, it also fulfills the social science credit. So if you're looking to fulfill that general education requirement, you can do so. It's on campus Monday, Wednesday from 2 to 3.50. We talked about a lot of different things related to health and science communication. Um, in fact, in the spring, since we'll have a spring symposium coming up, one thing that I'm hoping to do is to have us work on creating like health campaigns that we can show off at the symposium. So we'll do a lot of interesting things if you're interested in health and science issues, if you're looking at a career and things like health um, and similar types of topics, it's definitely an area to look at. Uh, but I just wanted to bring to your radar, not only to register for courses, but that this option is available for you if you're thinking about courses uh, to register from and trying to make a decision. So um, just wanted to let you know that that is available. So as a quick recap, uh, last class, we were going over sort of defining what rhetorical listening is and some of the things that implicate help to inform this definition. If you haven't already read through the Ratcliffe article, again, it can be a little bit of a dense or challenging read, and so I wanted to break down its two parts. Remember, you don't need to necessarily get everything down um, as you're reading through and trying to understand it. There are probably going to be things that are a little bit confusing, but to capture some of the key points and arguments, I think it's a good way to go. You're also welcome to work backwards if you haven't already completed the quiz for this week on Canvas. You can always open up the quiz, see some of the questions, and then go through the reading and use that to help guide uh, some of the areas to focus on and questions to answer. So that can help as well as you're working through. So we also talked about some of the challenges and theories. Um, so for instance, we were talking about the idea, the ocular centrism or the privileging of things like eyesight, oftentimes means that we associate, right, something like reading uh, with uh, something that's text versus listening with the ears uh, when we hear something that's spoken. We were talking about some of the issues surrounding uh, race and identity, and also some of the ways that listening has historically been gendered as well. Uh, getting into some of the challenges and disparities that we might encounter uh, throughout the listening process. We also broke down 
the core definition of rhetorical lip sync too, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, I do want to have a brief reminder regarding the first essay assignment for the class. So we talked about that uh, earlier this week in more detail, uh, but I do want to remind you that that first essay uh, is due a week from this Sunday and that you have those three prompts to choose from. It should be about four pages, double space, standard font and margins. You're again welcome to contact me in office hours to uh, send me a draft or send me an outline or questions as you're working through the, uh, the prompt in order to prepare and do the best job that you can on the assignment. So just know that that is coming up and uh, to start to brainstorm and prepare by the end of the week, I definitely recommend choosing your prompt of the three different prompts. So last class, we talked about the idea that rhetorical listening sort of has these three core steps. And we took some time to break down what these three steps were and what these three steps meant. And I think that'll be useful for us since I'll be doing an activity today where I'm asking you to think about your own listening and the ways that your own background has informed the way that you approach listening. The first idea here, right, is that knowing thyself is a really crucial part of doing listening. That the idea that knowing your own background in terms of culture, gender, uh, race, class, and so on, right? It is not that you are one thing, it's that you're the combination or intersection of the multiple aspects of identity that I think is useful to think about here. We'll talk more about political and social contexts of listening next week. Um, for instance, talking about what it means to be a socially responsible or active listener as it pertains to a lot of current events and topics. Uh, but, right, rhetorical listening, listening ethically means that we're thinking about some of the ways that differences start to form in the ways and styles that we listen. We also talked about, again, the idea that oftentimes we're compelled to or we think about listening from a defensive or a guilt type of perspective, that we listen because we think to ourselves, well, this will be bad if I don't, or if I don't pay attention to a message, right? So instead of that, we have a responsibility to listen, to understand, and to engage with other experiences. Listening is different from reading in a lot of different ways. Reading is a lot more focused on comprehension right, on what is the message, whereas listening is really focused on that process of deeply understanding and engaging with the content and, at times, right, disagree with the content of the message. And we talked about this idea of identification, right, that as we're listening and paying attention to a message, that we find things that we share in common with other people, uh, but also ways that we differ in the ways that we understand and engage with other people, and that those differences and similarities shape the way uh, that we can understand and engage in listening to. So for this class, uh, we'll be doing an activity that will apply some of these core ideas um, and ways to use rhetorical listening, as well as um, talking a little bit about uh, the listening reflection assignment. So the listening assessment, again, um, by the end of the day, Today, you'll be seeing your feedback and uh, grade on that. However, I did want to give you some preliminary feedback. Uh, I've done kind of an initial run looking through the papers and some of the things that I noticed there uh, that'll help you as you're thinking about future papers in the class. Again, I really recommend once you have the feedback up, using that to help you with drafting and working on that final draft. So, first of all, I thought people did a really good job of explaining and knowing the steps of the listening process, particularly those big five, right? I really appreciated that you all showed a good grasp of those and you were able to use those effectively. I thought there was also some good observations and summary from the conversations too, right? Using active listening and paying attention to the message seemed to pay off pretty well. And I like the way that you all engaged, again, with the material from the course. Some things to keep working on. Uh, one big thing that I noticed was in terms of paragraph structure. Uh, so one really good rule of thumb is to keep your paragraphs to about a half a page double spaced. If it goes longer than half a page, there's a good chance that you're moving on to a different idea or thought and that you can break those paragraphs up. Um, also, right, um, while I think there's good definition of a lot of the material, keep working on the applications, right? So for instance, 
here is the idea of recalling. And you define or explain what recalling is. And then you provide a direct application and to say, I use recalling because you know I remember this person's first name based on this experience. So um, you know, keep working on really linking together the concept you've defined with an example from uh, your conversation that connects to it. Uh, but again, uh, there were a lot of folks that did that really effectively. Just some preliminary things that I noticed in working through your essays. So what I'd like to do now is I have a longer prompt for you to work on independently. So I'll give you, you know, a good amount of time to think through and um, address this prompt. What I want you to do is again, because rhetorical listening is really about thinking about our own identities and experiences. I want you, and again, you're welcome to share to whatever extent you're comfortable doing in the context of this class, um, aspects of your background. For instance, you might think about certain things about your identity. Again, things that you might be comfortable sharing related to gender, race, ethnicity, class, nationality, sexuality, sexual orientation, a whole bunch of things. Again, it's up to you to decide what you would want to share. And then you might also think about, in addition to things about yourself, right? The groups that you're a part of, for instance, what is your family structure? What is um, what are some of the activities or groups or organizations that you find yourself a part of, or that are important to who you are, right? So think, take some time to think about and reflect on um, sort of how you define yourself as a person. And then uh, secondarily, right, once you've taken some time to brainstorm about that, I want you to think about rhetorical listening. Again, it deals with the idea that your background, your experience is shaping the way that you communicate and listen. So how has that background and experience shaped the way that you communicate? You might take some time to think about and reflect on that a little bit based on our discussions this, this week. And then lastly, I want you to think about a time outside of class where you talk with somebody. And you might think about the ways that culture has impacted how you and that other person engaged in the listening process. So there's a lot of parts here. So I'll give you a good amount of time to think through and work through this problem. Again, use the time to really reflect on and think about your own listening and how your background might be shaping the way that you listen to others.
keep that three or four more minutes. Go ahead and finish up the next couple minutes or so. Go ahead and finish up your current thought or idea that you're writing. What I'm going to have us do next is just take a minute to share uh, and talk a little bit about uh, what you worked on for this. So you can find somebody else in the class. You can also form a group of three. I'm going to have Zoom folks work together as partnership. And what I want you all to do is take some time to exchange uh, what you observe and discuss in regards to how you listen and some of the ways that you see things such as culture impacting the way that you listen. And then secondarily, uh, after you've done that and shared a little bit about how you listen, I want you to think about and discuss the ways that you see your listening as similar or maybe different. Uh, again, using that rhetorical listening way of thinking as a way to frame our own similar and contrasting approaches to listening. So I'll create a breakout room for the Zoom partnership and have everybody else uh, again find a partner or a group of three sitting near you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Honestly, apart from digging our car out, <laughs> trying to get around, uh, not a whole lot. I mean, uh, there's not, there's not. I'm going to be in Portland and the Philippines for a conference now, trying to catch up. Uh, and you have any anything exciting? This is football. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you all traveling? Or here? Most folks have just about wrapped up their discussion. Uh, so what I'll do is, uh, and you want to hear from each group, and maybe just have somebody that can share in each group about what you noticed is some of the similarities and differences in the way that you all listen. Again, thinking about uh, some of the ways that culture, background, and so on has shaped that listening process for you. Uh, so why don't we start here on this side oh, with uh, <laughs> Destiny and crew. Uh, or we can go back to you and see your Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of like differences that I noticed. Um, I guess culturally for him, it was more of like um, he could think of where he was from. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of influenced the way that he, I don't know, I guess interacts with people. Sure. So he said he's from Illinois. So when he came to Oregon, um, he said it's different, but it, like even though it doesn't really seem like it was different. And then I talked about uh, just like growing up in Scandinavia, like how the kids grow. You need to go to church. If you don't eat, like it's rude. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't say hello to people, like that's rude. Sure. Um, this is the second question. Oh, um, uh, sure. <laughs> so, um, also. We found kind of like a similarity in like our family units, like you know, kind of chaotic and stuff. Sure. And yeah, like she talked about, like I talked about how I would have all sisters and that kind of influences how I can communicate. And then she related to, what was it, your brother? Yeah, yeah so. The brother, yeah. So yeah. Has all sisters yeah. too. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. There's, <laughs> there's unexpected similarities there, right? Uh, I think it's really interesting how even when we think about like where you've lived or elements of like cultural background are being different, like there might be a similar experience of there's a lot of people in the family or you've lived in a location where there's like a lot going on. And I like the way that there's, uh, as Destiny brought up, like expectations on things like nonverbal or verbal feedback. Like you're supposed to check in with people, actively communicate, stay involved, right? And so the expectations on how you give feedback as part of the listening process can definitely look different. So that's a really good example. And I really appreciate the way you all kind of contrasted that. About uh, uh, this partnership over here. Uh, yeah, so we said that we were kind of brought up uh, in similar ways. Um, specifically, uh, we found uh, that our parents brought us up in the way that um, don't speak until the other person is done speaking. Uh -huh. um, and so one thing that one thing that we kind of found different was with my mom being a teacher, uh, she kind of brought me up in the way that um, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. That was her big saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of thought that had more of like a different effect on me because like her to come home and like treat her kids like she would her students kind of thing. Yeah, still has the teacher voice. Right, yeah, yeah. the teacher yeah. voice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing, Zach. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting, right, is that the like family background or like close relationships that you all have, uh, there's a lot of strange things that you pick up on, like habits and stuff through listening. I think I've mentioned this before, but both of my parents were like therapists and in the social work area. So I feel like there was a lot of 
jargon and language about social work and therapy that they would oftentimes bring in. And so when I was younger and I would make friends, sometimes people would be like, it feels like you're analyzing me, don't do that. Um, so it's interesting how the listening we pick up on from observing people close to us, right? Like a teacher can really impact the way that we choose to listen uh, ourselves or the habits we pick up on in our communication. So thanks for bringing in some of the things about how you all uh, found similarities there. About this group of three over here. Um, we found that like similar listening approaches are because of how we were raised, like culturally. Um, mm -hmm. Kanan and I actually have more similar similarities than like here has us because of yeah. we were around more people growing up because we were sports and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, bigger. And Garrett said that he had a smaller group, but it was always really loud. Like because yeah. when you're in a small group, you can fly as you want. So, mm -hmm. but we also found out that like a similarity that we always have that we all have is. Sometimes we find ourselves like checking out of conversations, like if it keeps dragging on. Sure. But especially with family members. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> especially with family yeah. members. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in part, right? That's kind of a, a like survival or maintenance response. There's so much information and stimuli happening that it's like the brain gets overloaded and at some point this task to tune out. Uh, and, you know, Listening is a resource. It's a thing that we can only dedicate so much time and effort to, especially if we're doing something like empathetic listening. That's a really difficult uh, and really kind of mind consuming process to do. So it's interesting that that was the similarity you all found in communicating with family in particular. And then how about the group of three back here? Um, for similarities, uh -huh. we kind of talked about how we are uh, there's definitely like institutions, I guess, like my families would put us in. It's mm -hmm. made us in the future, like look for conversations and there's people that we have in common with. Mm -hmm. They discussed a lot about how a lot of their uh, family events and stuff revolved around sporting events. So, now, in conversations, they look to find like, similarities of people on like, track teams and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I differ from them a little bit because I come from like background and so my dad's side is African American. Um and with them uh I feel like we I think we have several friends that different um have different expectations for conversation because the mom side was a lot smaller so you could have really um intimate conversations that are like more complex and stuff there's not as much background noise and such but then on that side a lot of family events had a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles and would like rent out spaces just to yeah. have like Thanksgiving gatherings and stuff. Sure. So I never expected to have super like deep conversations. It was more like acts of love on their side was um, for like watching the eggs or like, cooking for one another and stuff like that. Um, and there's just a lot of background noise and interruptions. So I have some friends that I don't expect to have deep conversations with and it's more like lacking with one another with uh, activities together and stuff, not necessarily the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these are some really good thoughts and observations here, really. I really appreciate, you know, the way that you bring in sort of the, like, a multicultural environment and the way that maybe, like, different sides of a family have different ways of communicating and working together. You know, it's kind of like this idea of code switching, right, where you're altering and changing the way that you listen and communicate depending on the people that you have around you or in your network, right? I like the contrast you bring up too with things like sports or shared activities being things that help people to listen and communicate fairly easily, but can also, it's not a shared interest or thing in common, right? Um, not be common ground in the same way. So it's definitely really important to think about, um, especially as you, a lot of you brought in, right? The role of family um, and the way that your family communicates or listens, right? Um, is not just universal, right? The culture and background of members of a family can really change some of the ways that we like mentally adjust and uh, change our listening and speaking style too. In a larger household where there's a lot of uh, common disagreement and discussion and uh, conversation cutting off versus one where uh, maybe there's more focus on letting a conversation just totally run its course without interruptions. 
How about folks on Zoom? Uh, what, what came up over uh, that conversation? Um, uh, oh, go for it. I'll go. Um, so our differences were that we didn't really, or like Mari didn't really communicate with people outside of her culture where like I went to a bilingual school for nine years and I had the opportunity to communicate with people outside my culture every day. And um, some similarities were that we were both bilingual. So we're able to communicate with people and understand like different language and it can be super beneficial in like um, a working experience or just like under a lot of different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So being bilingual, right, or having a background of communication uh, from different cultures can really help uh, for, um, you know, changing the way, like you were literally changing, you know, the language and the associated ways that, that language communicates. The words to describe listening or paying attention or the ways that people give nonverbal feedback can be really dependent on cultural background and difference. So I'm glad you all uh, brought that in too, right? Uh, for instance, sometimes there's parents that might come from a bilingual or multilingual culture and um, are speaking that language sometimes where the kids don't know what they're saying, but the parents do. Uh, there's also at times an emphasis on the importance of language um, and the way that language can really shape and impact the culture too. For instance, um, a lot of the tribes in uh, the area, for instance, uh, the Tegus, Umatilla, Walla Walla tribes in the area in Eastern Oregon and Washington, um, are actually have been developing a, a language program because they're trying to encourage uh, more children uh, to learn the native language who might not be familiar with or recognize it. So there's definitely some really important ways that language can impact that process of listening. So I'm glad you all uh, brought that to the table and had some really good observations here on languages impact on listening too. So thank you all for sharing. Again, I know that rhetorical listening, this whole idea of listening in this way can be a little bit weird. The article again is a little bit uh, dense, but I do think that it brings in some really good ideas and thinking about the role of things like culture and gender and so on play into the ways that we listen to and understand one another. Right, you're definitely um, not all listening in the same way. And I think it's really interesting that stuff like family background especially came up in looking at the differences and similarities in how we listen. So thanks for doing that. Um, so again, I know that it's Friday and um, you know it's been a long week and you all have a lot of midterms. So we'll wrap up a bit early for today. So we talked uh, today about Rhetorical listening, again, doing this activity, thinking about culture and the ways that it's impacted yourself, right? The idea that we have to mutually understand the language, um, the sort of norms and expectations. Again, this idea that not everybody listens in the exact same way. Somebody might stare deep into your eyes while you're listening. Another person is maybe taking notes. So thinking about how people listen differently as impacted by culture and identity is a really important consideration here. Thank you all for taking the time to share and to disclose uh, those elements of your background and the ways that that impacts your listening. Next week, we are sort of looking at the question, what does it mean to listen politically and socially, right? Um, this is more focused on what it means for us as we're dealing with an array of different topics and issues to think about what it means to be a good listener and to engage in a lot of these uh, challenging discussions that we continue to have. So look forward to that for next week and do complete the quiz by the end of this week if you haven't already done so. Uh, remember that registration is coming up uh, or has already started for a lot of you. So uh, make sure to register for spring classes. Uh, go ahead and email or pass forward to me your attendance activity for today. Have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy the snow and I'll see you again on Monday.